My name is Martin Rickman and uh, I'm going to introduce um, uh, a presentation which I've entitled Approaches to Peer Review. So the aim is to look at some of the issues associated with peer review, some of the, uh, the current topics um, that are being discussed um, and that various uh, publishers are trying to solve. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll start with a, a brief history, then look at uh, some of the, the current views about peer review, um, a few models uh, of, of how peer review is done. Uh, and then finally, um, just ask the question, what are we trying to achieve with peer review? Um, and, and a few um, conclusions and questions to end with. So peer review has been around for um, a, a fair amount of time, uh, but what we recognize now as, as peer review um, has really been around since uh, more or less the 1950s when the scope of journals began to broaden and it was too much simply for the editors to make the decision themselves. And so some kind of independent external peer review uh, with editor approval is now expected in, in most scholarly fields. Uh, and this is, is obviously how MDPI operates. Uh, currently, however, the last um, few years, people have been asking the question, in the digital age, is it possible to provide something that's a little bit different? Um, and uh, is peer review really performing the, the job that we want and, and other improvements that can be made? So here's a few recent quotes just to uh, d demonstrate these points. So these are all things that have come up in the last um, couple of months, really. Um, so um, firstly, a few quotes uh, saying um, about the problems uh, that peer review might experience. So for very selective journals, um, the top quote here, and if you go to the PDF version of, of this presentation, uh, you can follow the links that are uh, listed in blue. Um, so for very selective journals such as the, the British Medical Journal and the Lancet, um, the editors are not necessarily doing a good job of spotting the papers that will be the most highly cited. Uh, and in fact, in, in this study, um, the 14 most highly cited papers were rejected uh, by all three of the elite journals um, that were covered by the study. Um, the next about the NIPS conference. Um, this was where they, for a, a conference, there were two committees making decisions about accepting manuscripts, and 10% of, um, of, of the submissions were sent to both committees. And in fact, the committees disagreed more than they agreed, uh, which is interesting. Whether that has relevance to um, journal article processing um, is, is an interesting point, but at, at least it demonstrates that peer reviewers um, do not always agree with each other. Um, and then um, finally at the bottom on the slide is uh, issues that may arise with the, the peer reviewers themselves, um, that there are many instances of um, peer reviewers asking authors to cite their own work and maybe that's not always appropriate. Um, so journals have looked to implement some, um, some different models, um, of, of which more in a moment. And the top quote here is from uh, Brent Thomas. Um, who um, commented that they that um, he thinks that, that the uh, journal that he published in is a viable platform and was overall uh, impressed by the um, the process. However, the another interesting comment that I will not be committing a substantial amount of my work to this format in the future. Uh, and this is basically because the the journal is um, a little experimental. It doesn't have a high profile in the in the field. There's still many other considerations um, that authors have about where to publish. Um, Hilda Bastian has published in PLOS, uh, talking about the post-publication culture. And uh, there's a lot of debate now about um, post-publication peer review, whether this is something that should be encouraged more and whether that can help um, bring accurate, more accuracy into the peer review process. Um, recently, Nature Chemistry has uh, implemented a double-blind peer review option um, for its authors. Um, so uh, ev even the, you know, the, the top flight publishers and journals are, are thinking about different ways of conducting peer review. Um, a couple of quotes about some other issues. Um, so what does an editor actually do? And, and Ken Anderson, who's now the, the publisher of Science, Science uh, made the comment that there's still a need for filtering, selection, refinement, and finalization. So he still sees 
um, the role of an editor um, as as um, filtering for for quality and, and to some extent so that there's a there's a barrier that the um, published research um, should attain and, and has to pi has to pass. Also, uh, <coughs> just to highlight one, one instance here about recognition for reviewers that reviewers are. Um, are really giving their time for free um, and many researchers think that reviewers should be better credited um, for the critical uh, role that they play in the peer review process and that funding bodies and institutions in particular should pay attention to this. So here is a summary of the MDPI uh, review process uh, and this is, is pretty standard. We invite reviewers um, they um, hopefully accept our invitation, we, uh, we get the review back and then um, possibly after author revision um, the paper is sent for an editorial decision um, and obviously for an open access journal uh, the independence of this editorial decision is absolutely crucial and this is one of the, the really key steps of our process. Um, but th this process is, is pretty standard um, and we operate a single blind process. And what we'll see with the models that I'm about to present, um, different models of peer review, is that really they follow this process. The differences are um, really in, in what information is known um, uh, at what stage uh, and what is revealed. So we can summarize the approach in, in this table here that the, um, the authors don't know who the reviewers are, they don't know at any point, but the reviewers do know who the authors are. Um, and the reviews are confidential. Uh, with one um, title, Life, um, and also Atoms, actually the authors can opt to have the, the review reports published alongside um, their article. And the reviewers can also choose to sign their review. Uh, and as we saw in the conference yesterday, um, authors are in Life, about 30%, nearly 30% of the time, um, are choosing to publish the review reports. Reviewers are much more reticent to identify themselves um, uh, and that's really um, not, not a, a, a big problem. Um, and you can make arguments that maybe the reviewer identity should be kept confidential. Um, another very open um, model which has been operating since I, I think around the early 2000s is the British Medical Journal um, and this has become fairly standard within um, the medical field, um, which has a really gives no anonymity. So the authors know who the reviewers are, the reviewers know who the authors are. Um, the reviews um, are confidential during the review process, however, they are published alongside uh, the published paper. And uh, again, if you go to the PDF, you can click um, the link to see the editorial published by the British Medical Journal. So they're really, um, you know, ev even open review almost every journal that operates what it calls open review actually means a slightly different thing. Um, at what you might consider the other end of things are um, journals in business and, and some economics journals which operate double, double blind peer review. And it was quite curious to see that uh, nature chemistry is, um, uh, you know, which is, which is not from this background is, is starting to offer this as an option. So in this case um, not the, the reviewers don't know the identity of the authors um, and of course the authors don't know the identity of the reviewers either and the argument for this is that it will reduce bias against minorities and, uh, and junior scholars there have been some studies done um, but they've generally been fairly small and, and not particularly um, conclusive so it's not very clear that this, um, that this happens there's also studies that show that um, in up to 50% of cases, the reviewers can directly, uh, correctly identify the authors anyway. Uh, however, uh, many authors uh, like this, um, this system, and we're planning to introduce this during 2015 for some MDPI journals. And there are many other variations on the theme. So in physics, for example, um, m many articles are submitted to Archive, um, which is a, a pre-publication site before being submitted to a journal. Um, and there is really uh, no, um, you know, th 
th things that are published on archive are not necessarily submitted to a journal for publication. Um, but people, uh, scholars in, in the field, do read these papers um, and don't seem too worried um, that they haven't undergone peer review at that stage. So this it really allows fast dissemination of the work. That's the, the big ag advantage of that. Post-publication peer review is being pushed in some quarters. Um, so sites such as PubPeer and PubMed Commons are encouraging this. Uh, although the take-up is low, you know, the, the majority of articles don't have comments on them. Uh, many of the comments are also negative um, and there's some controversy about whether the comment should be anonymous or, or not. Um, this, although it in principle maybe seem like a good idea, actually in practice it doesn't seem to be particularly effective, at least so far, it hasn't really taken off. Um, a couple of journals that operate other systems, EMBO, um, in, in EMBO, the, this is a um, molecular biology journal, uh, the reviewers is becomes a discussion between the reviewers and the editors uh, and then the authors receive a kind of summary report which is published alongside the paper this is much more of um, a collective idea um, f1000 which is a spin-off from the faculty of a thousand website this is a journal where the papers as soon as they come in they have a, a very quick um, quality check and within two or three days they are published online and then the formal review takes place so um, you have the fast dissemination, but you also have the benefit of a formal review. And as the review um, reviews come in, the, the recommendations are published on the website, and then the uh, revisions by the authors are then published. And you can uh, you can basically follow the review process as it happens on their website. So that's a number of um, of models of peer review. But I'd like to um, just think for a moment about what should peer review achieve? Uh, what really is the, the aim of, of peer review? And uh, maybe you have some idea about that. And, uh, you know, I, I looked for, you know, some definitions uh, to, to really articulate this precisely. It's, it, it's quite difficult to find. Um, but the general ideas are in terms of maintaining some kind of quality, recognizing impact in the paper, um, and uh, obviously novelty. Um, but particularly the first two of these, I, um, I find can be quite problematic. So if you look at the quality of a, uh, of a paper, and then you start to ask, well, what, what level of quality is actually sufficient to be published? And how does peer review um, actually um, check for, for that quality because the peer reviewers don't check every single detail you know the peer review struggles to pick up uh, fraud for example if there are fabricated um, data that's quite difficult to pick up within peer review and uh, you know not, you, um, the re reviewer may not be a, an expert in every single aspect of the paper um, and you know, partially correct or speculative papers can actually be, be useful for driving innovation and driving the field forward. Um, and uh, factually correct papers can also be boring and actually dead ends, even though they are perfectly correct. On the other hand, as we saw earlier, if you try and gauge impact of a paper before it's been published and uh, you know, gaze into the crystal ball to, um, to see how many citations this paper will get, that's also a very difficult thing to do. So pr um, when editors start to try and predict the impact of a paper, that's also very, you know, could, can be quite dangerous and, and can lead to, you know, there's many examples where good papers have been um, rejected simply because the editor didn't like the, the topic and then it becomes a very personal matter of personal opinion. And this was a, a bigger issue for print journals where you, know, you can only publish so many papers in the digital age, this has more or less been taken out of the equation, um, especially starting with PLOS in 2006. So, I mean, my, my view really is that um, peer review should support the scientific process of, of discovery. And this kind of hangs in, uh, this, this tries to, to bring a balance between the idea of quality uh, and, and the idea of impact and, and all the factors that, that go into it. So, you know, we need we need a scientific process. We need to check that the conclusions um, are supported by the 
uh, by the data in, in the paper. Or, you know, obviously, there are, there are qualitative um, variations on this. You need to have a, a logical discussion. Uh, and and the, the paper should encourage novelty. And you, know, you can really ask in publishing this paper, will it help to um, drive the, to push the field forward uh, and may, may lead to other interesting discoveries? So just to conclude, um, in terms of the underlying process, in terms of in inviting reviewers, uh, making a decision, and editorial approval, um, all of the, the models that I've presented above are pretty much identical. Um, the differences uh, which are, are really allowed by the, the digital age are in terms of um, the openness of, of the process. Who knows what, what do you, whether you publish to review comments with the uh, with the paper, uh, and also you know rapid publication. Authors are really concerned about getting their um, their work out rapidly, uh, and now that the publication and shipping time is is not such an issue, authors are starting to ask, well, how can we do this quicker? And so a, a fair system of review, whichever one you want to take, need, needs to uh, needs to consider the needs of the authors, um, the needs of the reviewers. Um, we, you know, we can't hurry re reviewers if we're looking for a, a really fast um, publication time. We need to, to give that consideration. Uh, the needs of the editors uh, and also the needs of the readers. So a few questions just to finish off. Um, just from your personal, your own personal experience, what do you find is the most frustrating aspect of, uh, of peer review as you've uh, experienced it? And uh, do any of the, the models above kind of sound attractive? for solving that problem. Um, is it possible to to make review uh, peer review faster while maintaining the quality? Uh, and we've seen some of the um, the models above uh, are trying to achieve this. Uh, and also what can be done to motivate and recognize reviewer contribution? Um, can can we uh, at MDPI be, be doing more for this? Well, thank you for your attention. And I hope you found this uh, useful.